The learning objectives for this talk include learning the performance of brain ultrasound in infants, to learn the normal ultrasonographic brain anatomy, and to learn the ultrasound appearance of brain hemorrhage and ischemia and their sequelae in premature and full-term infants. We use a variety of transducer frequencies in the infants, in those babies who are quite large, those who are more than approximately five to six months of age and who are full term, we will generally use a three megahertz probe. We will at times have to use a curvilinear broad bandwidth so that we can penetrate to the depths of the brain. Normally the fontanelle, the anterior fontanelle, is opened until about nine to 18 months of age. This could be open longer in babies who are premature or babies who have increased intracranial pressure. In babies who are somewhat smaller, we may use a five megahertz. And then in the babies who are premature or full term, we will, in the neonatal period, use an eight five megahertz. For scalp lesions, we will generally use a linear array probe that is at least 10 megahertz, often going as high as 17.5. The posterior fontanelle is generally opened until zero to four months of age and may be open longer in premature infants and infants who have increased intracranial pressure. Now we generally obtain our images using coronal and sagittal planes. In the coronal plane, we're going to sweep the brain from anterior to posterior, and we will be looking for certain landmarks. This is a drawing showing a coronal section of the brain in an infant. We can see the interhemispheric fissure. We see the cingulate gyrus, this hammock-shaped area Below the interhemispheric fissure represents the corpus callosum. And then below the corpus callosum, we have the right and left lateral ventricles, which connect via the foramina of Monroe bilaterally to the third ventricle. We also notice the sylvian fissure. In the region of the sylvian fissure, we will visualize the pulsations of the middle cerebral artery, just above the corpus callosum, we will see the pericolosal artery, and within the cingulate gyrus, we'll see the pulsations of the colloso marginal artery. The goal of the sonogram is to image as much of the brain as we need to to have a complete evaluation, which implies that we will at times be obliquing the transducer to the right and to the left to see over the convexities of the brain. The object of the sagittal plane is to examine the midline structures for anomalies and to evaluate in a parasagittal plane the ventricular system as well as the parenchyma of the brain. As we scan in a straight anterior posterior or AP plane in the midline, we will see the corpus callosum the genu, the body, the splenium, and just below the corpus callosum will have the cavum septum pellucidum. Below that area, we have the third ventricle. We will see the massa intermedia when that ventricle is enlarged. And then this continues through the aqueduct of Sylvius to the fourth ventricle. We'll visualize the cerebellum and the cisterna magna, as well as the brain stem. And depending upon the gestational age of the infant, we may or may not see the convolutional markings of the brain. As we look at the parasagittal views, we'll image the ventricular system. And as we extend our view more peripherally, we'll see the substance of the brain parenchyma. Bear in mind that when you're trying to visualize the ventricles, that the frontal horn is more medially positioned than the occipital horns, and so the anterior portion of the transducer needs to be more medially positioned than the posterior portion of the transducer. 
Let's look at some of the ultrasound anatomy. This is a very far anterior view. You know that this view is very far anterior because you can see the left and the right orbits. The interhemispheric fissure is seen here. And note that there are little areas of brighter echogenicity in the frontal lobes. This is what is referred to as the periventricular blush. It represents vascular markings as well as neurons as they extend from the deep white matter to the cortex of the brain. As we extend our view a little bit more posteriorly, but still in the anterior plane, we see that there is interhemispheric fissure. Here's the cingulate gyrus. We can see the corpus callosum here as a hammock-shaped structure that is very poorly echoic that is just below the brain parenchyma here in the frontal lobes. We have a portion of the right lateral ventricle, a portion of the left lateral ventricle, and we're beginning to get into the areas of the caudate nuclei bilaterally represented by these slightly brighter areas of increased echogenicity. We're also beginning to see these Y-shaped structures that represent the sylvian fissures. As we come back just a little bit more posteriorly to an anterior mid-coronal view, we again see the interhemispheric fissure with the cingulate gyri. We can see the corpus callosum and image the lateral ventricles. Note that the inferior lateral aspect of the frontal horns are concave and that we can see the choroid plexus as it goes through the foramina of Monroe as brighter areas of echogenicity and choroid plexus in the region of the roof of the third ventricle. The third ventricle may or may not be seen on the anterior mid-coronal views. Note the sylvian fissures bilaterally and also the bright echogenicity that is in the region of the hippocampal gyrus bilaterally as we look at the region of the temporal lobes. The little dots that we see centrally in the temporal lobe represent the temporal horns. A little bit more posteriorly, we get to the mid-posterior coronal view. Note in this view that we see this pie-shaped area of bright echogenicity that represents the cerebellum. A little bit farther back, we've reached the posterior coronal view, and we see these bright areas of increased echogenicity that are the glomi of the choroid plexus, which we'll look at in more detail when we look at the parasagittal views. These are generally quite symmetric. As we look a little bit more posteriorly, we see the periventricular blush around the posterior portions of the brain. And we're looking here at the occipital lobes. The periventricular blush represents vascular markings as well as neurons that are coursing from the deep white matter to the cortex of the brain. One may encounter a variant where there is a symmetry in the size of the choroid plexus that is basically physiologic and not indicative of an abnormality. Note that the right side of the baby's head is up on this particular view. Remember that the choroid plexus is buoyed up by only one part of the roof plate so that if there is a change in the position of the baby's head, the side that's up tends to appear larger than the side that is down. Notice when we turn the baby's head the other way with the left side up, we now see that this glomus of the choroid plexus looks as though it is larger. It really isn't. This is an artifact of positioning. If there's ever a question, you can always turn the baby's head, of course, with the support of the nurses, because most of these babies are attached to life support systems, and it is extremely important not to dislodge an endotracheal tube or other intravascular catheters or enteric tubes. Also consider the extra axial fluid spaces. We measure routinely 
the sinocortical width by identifying the superior sagittal sinus, measuring from the sinus to the outer margin of the cortex of the brain in a normal baby, we'll see that the sinocortical width measures 0.4 to 3.3 millimeters. We also routinely measure the craniocortical width. This is the depth from the cranium to the cortex, and this should not measure more than 0.3 to 6.3 millimeters. We measure the interhemispheric fissure, and this should not measure more than 8.2 millimeters. Here's the ultrasound rendition. We're measuring from the superior sagittal sinus to the cortex of the brain bilaterally, and we're measuring from the cranium to the cortex of the brain, as well as the interhemispheric fissure, and all of these numbers fit into a normal range. Also consider the presence, the number, and the configuration of the gyri, which are proportional to the gestational age of the infant. Notice that it is not until 26 weeks gestation that we begin to see the development of the cingulate sulcus and gyrus. As the babies mature from 26 weeks gestation up to full term, there is an increase in the number of convolutional markings until at term there are multiples. It, this is an important detail to be aware of as there are certain congenital anomalies of the brain that are associated with lack of formation of the convolutions. The corpus callosum should be looked for on every brain ultrasound study. This is the largest medial interhemispheric commissure that contains fibers that interconnect the cerebral hemispheres, thus allowing for sharing of memory and learning between the two sides of the brain. The corpus callosum forms during the third to fourth fetal month. It grows as a bud from the lamina terminalis, grows upward and backward, while the brain grows laterally and posteriorly. Notice, too, that there is a fluid space below the corpus callosum. This is the cavum septum pellucidum, and the more immature the baby is, the younger the gestational age, there will be a posterior extension to this fluid-filled space called the cavum virgae. This should not be mistaken for a cyst within the brain. So here we have the genu, the body, the splenium of the corpus callosum. And here we see the